Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to this great launch, book launch event. The book, as you all know, of course, is called Creativity as Commodity Behind the Independent Cluj Cultural Scenes. The book was written by Miki Branishta. We all love Miki, obviously. For those very few of you who do not know Miki Branishte, I will tell you that uh, she is an assistant uh, professor at the Faculty of Theatre. She's a curator, a cultural manager. She's a uh, member of the board of directors of the Paintbrush Factory in Cologne, and for many years she was the organizer of the Tondimage Festival. I will give her the floor a bit later. I'm not going to uh, overtake the mic, but I would like to say a few introductory words about how we're going to organize this event. Following Mickey's intervention, we're going to listen to a few presentations by our guests. Our guests are Miruna Runkan, professor at the Faculty of Theatre and Film, just like um, Miki, Eugen Ponesco, architect and urban planner, we also have Lala Panait, who's an urban anthropologist and who's also part of uh, Collective A Association. You, those of you who live in Cluj already know her from her uh, project um, in Monastur. And then we have Cornel Ban, Associate Professor of International uh, Political Economy from Copenhagen Business School, and Loran Maxim, who's a theatre director and general manager of Transit Foundation. Today's event is taking place at Transit House and is part of a series of events uh, where we're celebrating 25 years of, um, of this, uh, this space. Many happy returns, hopefully. So, creativity. We are all creatives, for sure. And this sounds ideal, but maybe it's not as ideal as it sounds like. Maybe it's not the best thing to all be creative and make money out of being creative. Among other things, uh, Mickey's book uh, tackles this point as well, as well as many other phenomena that have happened in Cluj, cultural-wise, arts-wise arts in Cluj. Mickey, you have the floor. Good evening. Thank you very much, Juana, for this introduction, for these kind, wo kind words. Thank you for your trust. I will very briefly tell you about how I got to... Excuse me. I'm just slightly nervous. This wasn't staged. So I will briefly talk to you about this uh, book, which is the result of a PhD thesis. Mrs. Runkan here was my uh, coordinator. I started in 2018 and basically started with feelings, unpleasant feelings and sensations um, that I could feel in the city. They wouldn't let me let go of me and I really wanted to go deeper and see what they meant. I was under the impression that many things were changing, urban planning wise, work wise, uh, especially in the cultural field. For several months, I was a bit of lazy bones. I started reading, but not too much. And then at some point, there was an event. And this event was the trigger uh, for a very thorough study. Namely, the fact that we lost our paintbrush factory in Cluj. When you write a PhD thesis, you first of all read studies about the topic. I did, uh, I took the other way around. I uh, started with a case study, with a paintbrush factory case study. I wanted to see what the conditions were for this independent cultural space to pop up in Cluj. And finally, what the changes were that led to, to the atomizing of the community and to our losing the space. In order to understand these things much better, of course, I had to uh, delve deeply into several theories and the theories ranged from cultural policies to uh, urban renewal policies 
and all the way to studies about creative industries, creative cities, or creative classes, and so on and so forth. What I've noticed in these studies was how the reasons why the state encourages or doesn't encourage culture change. And in fact, it's also about the access to culture. That's the main topic. And I believe one effect would be the changes in EU policies that uh, start off as uh, from seeing culture as w with a social high social value, and then seeing it as uh, having a high economic uh, value. So I wanted to see how this change happens, and what the reasons for the change uh, are. We're also talking about uh, the 2008 uh, economic crisis. This crisis led, um, led the EU cultural projects to be more attuned to, to the economy. Most of the arguments within uh, Creative Europe saw culture as an element that supports the cultural development of the, uh, the EU member states uh, as a contributor to the, to the GDP. There are other, there are so many influences on our jobs as cultural actors. We used to be called cultural managers, but uh, now within the EU program that in the meantime has been improved uh, with new priorities, uh, we are called, we were simulated to become a cultural entrepreneurs, in fact. And that is deeply rooted in the economic value uh, that the culture has um, been assigned. The EU's argument is to connect uh, culture, the competitive advantage, and uh, so on. We, of course, access EU funds. We uh, take on the language that the EU uses, and we uh, we propagate basically the same language. Many applications I have read show that the business language has permeated into the language of cultural actors. However. What I do believe is very important, something we should pay attention to, apart from these intrusions, would be the fact that we no longer speak of diverse policies. We speak of a dominant vision, a main vision, that also um, the, that includes the um, the economic and non-economic areas. And this lack of distinction creates tension between the two sides. And we can see this within the cultural sector. It is also, it, it's important to say this because a uniform and uh, a, a uniform speech will lead to a very conservative approach. And the non-lucrative area uh, of, of the culture sector will no longer be able to survive as long as it doesn't make profit. As an evaluator, I can say that there are m more companies, in fact, instead of um, instead of associations and NGOs. So this means that there is a whole shift from non-profit organizations, uh, which are generally connected to the democratic value of culture, towards small companies, small enterprises that are very much related to the economic value of uh, culture. This was just an overview. I have also delved into the brief history of of the independent cultural space uh, at large in Romania. 
I uh, was interested especially in Cluj. I wanted to see what other organizations there were in Cluj before the paint brush factory and what their stake was at the time. We, as a generator of gallerists and curators, we were connected to the values of the first uh, independent workers in Cluj, independent cultural workers in Cluj. And I'm really happy to be able to see tonight so many people who were our mentors. Um, Casa Transit, the place we're in, the Transit House, where we are nowadays, uh, today, uh, was also part of this. Um, I was here 20 years ago. I can see a representative from IDEA as well. So I can see that there's, there are still connections to this past. Within this uh, study dedicated to the independent cultural scene and to its brief history, I was particularly interested in the stakes and uh, attitudes of the independent workers in culture, their relationship with the state, with the f um, sponsors and their relationship uh, well in fact their status as employee all these elements have become factors in the analysis I have at the end of the book in brief I have basically started four generations of cultural workers. Uh, there are five or six nowadays. These are fundamental, uh, there are funda fundamental um, events to the cultural scene in uh, Romania. One of them is the economic crisis in 2008. Another one would be uh, the 2013 uh, protests uh, for Rocia Montano against the gold mine. Uh, the, the artists in Cluj were very well connected to the protests back then. In an attempt to erase the differences between the non-profit and the uh, for-profit uh, bits of the cultural scene, there is another attempt to blur the line between what's public and what's private. And here again, it's very important to know what kind of culture we disseminate, what kind of culture we create whether we're interested in um, in there being uh, a public good um, kind of culture. For this, we need the state's intervention, obviously, because the state is the one that can ensure a structure, a structural context for the public to be able to access culture. In trying to define what independent means, independent space, independent artist, I realized that there are so many factors to take into account. So it would be important to find a different paradigm, a different paradigm that would better correspond to the present time. So my proposal is for the future to talk about <coughs> to talk about uh, a paradigm of inter dependence. I have one more minute and I would like to say in conclusion something about I would like to say about the tension between the for-profit and non-for-profit sides of the cultural scene. We could see that struggle within the paintbrush factory here in Cluj as well. From my perspective, this tension is one of the reasons why the community fell apart. We lost the paintbrush factory and that was one of the reasons that eventually, after two years, led to the to the vanishing of the project, and some of our colleagues just went to other spaces, smaller spaces that are not necessarily connected to each other. Some of them still maintain contact, but uh, we no longer have that uh, communal spirit, and that was simply because we were sharing the same space. So it's really important to have your own space. 
where you can create connections and generate contact. I would like to say one more thing, namely about the, the local effects of the paradigm of culture and creativity. That is what I tackle in my last chapter. Of course, we can talk about gentrification, we can talk about the festivalization of the city of Cluj. These are two of the main issues. What do I mean by festivalization? Through festivalization, the cultural cycle, which is made up of four stages, only focuses on one of the stages, which is dissemination. And that helps the intermediaries, the middlemen, and not the producers or the artists uh, in the cultural scene. As a general conclusion, in a nutshell, the paradigm of creativity, we do call it the paradigm of creativity. However, this does not support artists. It doesn't support creative people. It creates a competitive advantage for those people who have spaces or for those who finance the projects of artists. It generally uh, benefits uh, those people who already have the necessary capital, a capital that, uh, that the artists not necessarily have. However, all is not lost. Maybe we can uh, tackle this conclusion during the debate. Thank you. thank our hosts for welcoming us so warmly in such a beautiful context. Uh, they are celebrating 25 years of existence, 25 years of uh, Transit House. Yes, 25 years ago you were in kindergarten, we get it. I remember that 25 years ago I heard about this uh, space in Cluj at the time I was living in Bucharest and I heard about this uh, transit house oh, during um, an interval at a theatre festival and I heard this from Radu Afrim he was so happy and he said you know, this amazing thing is happening in Cluj. And I think he was one of the first people to, to have uh, one of his first shows here in Casa Transit, Transit House. I think I will brag a little bit later on. Yes, this is a happy celebration, a happy year for me at least. It's not often that we see the launch of uh, three books during the same year. Three books that rest on a PhD thesis that are very important. This is a reason to be celebrating and uh, something to be proud of. In spring, the first Romanian monography by Janu Janovic was published. Delia Yenedi, who wrote the book, can only be proud of that, and I'm also proud of it, because I really wanted this monography to be published, I really wanted this PhD thesis to be written. The second uh, book launched this year is the one we're uh, talking about tonight. I will go into more details about this one. And there's uh, another book that will be launched in Bucharest next week, published by, <coughs> by a former researcher. And that book is dedicated to in, in fact, 
it is a book of the theatrical aspect of the celebrations uh, on the 23rd of August. And it's a very compelling book, please trust me. But going back to our book launch tonight, I'm really happy that this book is, book is being launched. And I would invite uh, those of you who can to write about this book because it is an extraordinary book. It is a scientific study and at the same time it is also a manifesto that we've been needing for so long. This book puts things into a 3D perspective. It shows crystal clear how, just like pragmaticians were saying uh, at the end of the 20th century, so words give life and create, create life. Concepts are not just code. Some of them produce effects in our daily lives, even if we don't realize it uh, at first sight. <coughs> The book proves that in Romania, but not only in Romania, but it proves that in Romania and in Cluj, a shift has happened. I'm talking about a political shift. The shift comes from the EU's obsession uh, of believing that things uh, that the grass is greener on the other side, on the other side of the pond. So we borrowed this uh, very soft concept of creativity. It's a very nice, soft, cute little concept, isn't it? And we try to introduce this concept of creativity in our education. We try to convince all the relevant fora that young people need to develop their cre creativity. And that is because creativity will develop people's thinking, uh, people's identities and the capacity for free thinking. So it's a nice and decent word. It does no harm. That said, we have to be careful how we use it. What this wonderful <coughs> book uh, written by Miki Branishta demonstrates is that that furtively this concept of creativity has acted as a mask. It has acted as a mask uh, that helped to commodify the cultural act. Along the lines of uh, laissez-faire, culture has to produce money and has to survive by producing money, which replaces another political concept, another political concept that is much more deeply related to us. This is something we've only, only aspired to over the past 30 years because we haven't really implemented cultural uh, policies, public cultural policies in Romania. We haven't even uh, outlined them. So this uh, concept I'm talking about was uh, culture as a public good, as a public service. This is something we, we would have needed. We've uh, wasted 30 years and we haven't managed 
to convince any of the governments that the act of culture is a public service, a public good, that it is something that comes to the benefit of people. This is not just a flight of fancy. So this book we are talking about tonight clearly demonstrates the whole process of, of commodifying culture. And that comes to replace authentic culture and comes to the detriment of the beneficiaries who need culture. The beneficiaries of the cultural act don't always know they need culture. But they do find out that they need it if they are immersed in culture one way or another. If this act of culture somehow touches their personal life. But this is uh, the realm of public policy. If we replace public policies with festivals like Untold, then huge festivals will, will produce a lot of money, it's true. But the same money that is produced will be used for products that have no connection whatsoever to the space where the festival takes place. In general, those services, those products, have no connection to the be final beneficiary. Usually, people in Cluj just uh, move away from the city when the festival takes place. They go to their grandparents, people go on a holiday, people go away from Cluj just to avoid the huge festival. So the beneficiary does not benefit from culture, the beneficiary benefits from entertainment. <coughs> Hence, this confusion which is supported between cultural communication and entertainment, strictly speaking. Of course, culture has its entertaining dimension as well. But Miki Pranishte manages to demonstrate that there is just uniformity due to this festivalization, that there is a loss of identity. Cultural uh, well, artists and cultural managers eventually uh, go bankrupt. Apart from this, what happens is that ordinary citizens are deprived of, the, of their fundamental right to benefit from public services and public goods. I would like to congratulate Miki Branch for pinpointing this idea in her book. Because from my perspective, and as I see things, this book is the most important, in fact, publication over the past 10 years in the cultural scene. Good evening. The 25 years have been important for me as well. The 25 years are slightly more than half of my active life. I don't think I've seen this uh, room full in more than three years. And I think it's a privilege for us to be able to be here and debate about a book. A book uh, that mentions so many people who are in the room tonight. I think it's a great joy and a privilege for us to be able to debate uh, this topic and this book uh, here in person. This book will be long-lived for sure. It is worth reading and rereading because every time we read it we will notice new nuances, new analysis, data, annexes and also memories. Memories that many of us hold. 
as well as connections between events that we maybe didn't make at the time or connections that we have forgotten in the meantime. And I think Mickey's book manages to bring all of these together. And she brings all of these together in a way that shows us how the city has come to the point where it is today. It has become a model uh, for other cities as well. This is not just a book about Cluj Napoca. It is a book about the country. It is a book about the draws parallels, parallels to other countries as well. But basically, it depicts how Cluj Napoca has managed to uh, um, carry on individually. This is a feeling my friends and I have. We, uh, we think about how uh, the city relates to the state, and uh, this is something we can find in the book. And uh, my friends and I have been talking about uh, the relationship uh, between uh, culture and the state. Uh, more often than not, this relationship is inexistent, and uh, many times it doesn't function very well. I don't want us to forget that uh, the discussions uh, found in the book started back in the 90s so when the mayor of the town was Gheorghe Funar. <coughs> For sure, at the time, uh, the independent scene was, uh, was very poor at the time. And uh, Casa Transit, the transit house, was one of the main places where things happen culturally. Please excuse me if I haven't mentioned the other exceptions. This infrastructure, which was just a one-point infrastructure, managed to create ripples around it, and so many, so many other initiatives. Uh, were drawn to this space and then were created through this space. As for the um, analysis of the book and the chapters I managed to read, I would like to thank Miki, I got the, the book in advance. I should be talking about space as an urban planner and as an architect. Someone was looking at me when when people mentioned spaces and urban spaces. And I think I can do that. I can talk about space. <coughs> it's highly important to realize that the cultural phenomena taking place in Cluj and in other cities are very deeply related, positively and negatively, to access to spaces. This is a debate we've, this is an ongoing debate. We had such a, such a debate last week on Trajan Street in Cluj. <coughs> we notice uh, migrations of small initiatives looking for space. This is just a tiny bit of the discussion, but I think this is a hurdle. because we need access to spaces and we need to be able to maintain spaces, spaces that are not institutions. I think that access to these spaces is also blocked. It's much better and easier when uh, spaces manage to generate services and uh, cultural products that are valuable and well-known enough and acknowledged internationally because then that institution or that space um, is part of the basically business card of the city, let's say. But we should also, we should also um, support and maintain the smaller initiatives, not just the ones that are already well known. There are so many tiny spaces where we can see cultural events happening that we need to maintain and support. And I think we as individuals um, and together, we should find a way of uh, <coughs> constructive conflict. Because without 
this kind of constructive conflict, we won't be able to come out of the spiral that the, the book uh, describes. This is very clear in the conclusions of the book because there is an open end to the discussion in the book as well. I didn't expect the book to come up with solutions, but I do believe that it's in our power and uh, we need it in our hands to come up with solutions. We're really uh, interested uh, to, to have such initiatives. Uh, the paintbrush factory is gone, the transit house is facing problems and other spaces as well. So there's always insecurity and there's always a struggle with such spaces. And this is catastrophic for a city that boasts uh, the uh, vitality of its culture. I find this petrifying not to mention uh, the state of uh, the state uh, the state of um, cultural institutions so i think that very quickly we need to come up with uh, answers to questions such as what do we do how do we do it and to do so quickly as long as we still have people to to talk to and creative people to create with I feel very accountable and responsible and I'm very willing to talk to anyone to come up with a solution that is legal, obviously, desirable as well. And I think uh, we, should, uh, we should talk about uh, uh, purchases, uh, European projects, uh, national uh, uh, pro recovery projects and so on. But I think there's uh, no more time to be wasted. The book uh, makes a distinction between festivals and other kinds of production. I think that festivals are also important and have their own role. And we shouldn't uh, come up with an opposition between creation and permanent production and festivals. We shouldn't oppose the two. If even festivals my, uh, might um, face struggles, I'm sure there are solutions at hand. Some of them quite easily reachable. Others are more complicated. But I believe that the role of the national and local authorities is to is not to become space owners, although I wouldn't oppose that, so that wouldn't be their role. Th their role would be to to maintain to um, to manage the spaces. They are not the facilitator, they are not the market, ma marketing agent. They should ensure that uh, cultural events can happen. We have such models all throughout Europe. A few weeks ago, uh, I went to Portugal and I spoke to an association that uh, owned a building, an industrial building. It was like a warehouse. In fact, they were renting the space from uh, the town hall, and the town hall was renting it from the Ministry of Defence for a period of 50 years. The city hall was just um, the middleman. It wasn't investing anything, it wasn't doing anything. It was just the facilitator, in fact, between the state and this uh, cultural initiative. Otherwise, we won't be able to uh, get out of this situation. We won't be able to escape it. We can see so many spaces uh, going out in ashes. We don't need to blame other initiatives or festivals because the city is made to be used, to be recycled, reused, repurposed. But that makes things become ephemeral and too fragile. And if authorities do not take on this responsibility, their role uh, and uh, do not become accountable, uh, we're going to face this kind of fragility. I would really like to talk about this to all of you.
it would be great to have uh, group talks, different group talks, to see how Cluj can become a model again and come out of this very fragile situation that followed a wonderful situation, which was a pioneering situation before the current one. I think we should come back to that uh, favorable cycle and come up with solutions for Romania uh, that are new to Romania, maybe not so new to Europe, but solutions that will help us uh, come out of this uh, situation that is a bit chilling for us. And I think we can do this. I think it's possible. I will stop here for the moment. <coughs> it's been as well 25 years since I graduated. The faculty of Tatra Film because I moved from Cluj, I've started becoming nostalgic. Um, I won't talk too much because I prefer more the form of a debate. At the end of the day, we're a community here. In a sense, I get back the feeling from Tom Dimash at the beginning of the festival when the space was not enough or it didn't have enough chairs for the audience. So at the end of the day, we end up with a discussion about space again. Because my main part of the job was related to the people, I will talk more about this topic, topic which is well associated with many nostalgic aspects. I would just say some terms that are important, social, friendship, community. I even get emotional. Solidarity, traumatic, even burnout. But at the same time, we were able to start from scratch every time. I'm sorry, I get emotional. tried to keep the spirit up against the fact that we went to protests, against the fact that we were working in community projects and we would not always have fans, but the motivation was there to work together towards a better Cluj. Our grants were not always the funds or the money, but the audience, the public, the community. And even more so, when I started working in a public institution, I realized again that the most important thing that I ever lived was the notion of liberty, of freedom. This is the reason why I wasn't able to resist in an institution like that. At the end of the day, that's the point, to, to speak out what we think, to put out the projects that we have in our hearts. Even though we had conflicts at times with the public authorities. And at the end of the day, I don't see the authorities in this room tonight. So we end up again in an event <coughs> where the same people come, show up. We're not in a dialogue with our local authorities. But we always wished for a partnership with these local authorities. But getting back to the topic, what I liked most and what was a surprise, especially because I supported her in the process of writing, she had a great capacity in being objective, but at the same time being very frank. I'm really glad that she had the capacity to to put out and to describe the events in a very sharp mode. I try to avoid 
uh, this aspect, and I'm happy that Eugene has mentioned uh, the topic of solutions. Just as Eugene said, when you go to other cities, in my case, I moved to Brussels, I start to feel a lack of a social community. And I remember how these societies here in Cluj, I get a sense that there is a, there's a community here fighting back, who tries to <coughs> get things into motion. And maybe this makes this place a point where we could make a shift towards a better future. Against the fact that we're speaking about ideal things, I do think this is a mature way of putting this in realistic terms. The question is what do we do from here? I was thinking because it's the season of mushrooms. I was thinking about the relationship between mushrooms and trees in the cities because they seem to be less in the city. This relationship seems to to have been discontracted in time. We were able to go and seek for mushrooms alone, but maybe we can take this as a model because we were able to work independently from the state. But maybe we should talk about new allegiances, <coughs> especially because we're all here in Cluj. But even if we're not, we, we can still be connected. Against the fact that the state often gives us the sense that we're abandoned. Thank you. I feel a bit as an invasive presence here. The last time I was here was when a film played, play was played here, Three Sisters, by Chekhov. The public was mostly form of the aristocracy from Bucharest. It was an interesting moment followed by a concert. I'm going to say two main points. And I'm going to speak more from, the, from an outside perspective. From the standpoint of methodology, I do think this book opens up many debates not only for the creative sector, but even from the point of view of history and anthropology, the research in anthropological terms is very, very seriously made. This book gives an external validity to, to the sector of anthropology because it links external contexts from different countries with the context of uh, university current context in Romania. This opens up a new conceptual frame for me. In this model that Mickey calls Hollywood Broadway translated to our context comes across as a tragedy, as a tragic scenario. Because it does not come with a financial backup and support. It, it proposes the model of a liberal market without the funds.
We are talking about transnational institutions that buy cultural products. In a sense, Miki's case study describes the worst case scenario. We are talking about neoliberalism. In a background where this, this flow, cash flow, does not properly work. And it generates a crisis that we now live. It seems like the, the economic crisis has, has produced a, a crisis, but it's also the digital sector that has developed more and more and has enhanced this crisis. And it has linked to again to the topic of spaces. We're in a crisis of space, and the competition comes from the digital sector because the IT sector searches for spaces. The model according to which Cluj develops is different from how the economical crisis was lived in other countries such as Greece. There were not protests like in Greece, for example. But the main cause of this destruction, and you mentioned this in your book, it's a discrepancy in structure. <coughs> this growth in the digital sector has made pressure on the problem that we experience in the cultural section because it's problematic to exploit the cultural sector as a commodity. And here comes the need to somehow reinvent ourselves as cultural people. But this is a question that maybe maybe should be discussed in a second volume of the book. But we should talk about the future, because this is the question at the end of the day. I would say what Mickey outlines in the book is not something dualist like we have in the in the French model. It's a paradigm of public service versus the paradigm of the market. We have culture and the culture, creative culture of commodities. In the creative market where where the, the funds dictate the way culture develops. Talking about this dualism, I would make a point. <coughs> Statistically speaking, I looked at before this meeting how the state funded, what, what are the modes of funding accorded by the state. One is the public service, which is really rigid, and the other one <coughs> is a sector that it's, it's funded more than needed, that has a nationalist character. If you look into, into what's funded in terms of culture, in terms of, of religion, for example, or folklore, you will notice there's a tendency to fund those aspects of culture that are nationalist in, in essence. There are always 
access for the institutions that represent this sector of the culture that that has access to the spaces. For example, we can talk here about religious cults. If you look into this statistical data, you would see a strong asymmetry. So we have an underdeveloped public service which is poorly funded and we have the other side which is overly funded that relates to this nationalist um, and here here comes the, the real tension If we look to the tensions of our, our local economy, there's an interdependency and it's not bad in essence. We developed quite well compared to other countries, but it has generated a couple of tensions, economical, cultural in nature, which creates an association between neoliberalism and nationalism. And if we look to those factors that legitimize certain aspects in the history of art, if we look, for example, to models from Hungary or Poland or Slovakia, what do we see actually? A nationalist ideology that gets theorized. Trying to redefine several important points from history in nationalist terms. which somehow gives sense to the fact that funds are directed toward this type of cultural products. <coughs> because neoliberalism is so strongly linked to nationalism, it can be that the end of this nationalist discourse will lead to a decrease <coughs> and will influence many of the economical aspects. This means public funds that are less and less accessible. It will imply different geopolitical shocks which will create a state of austerity and the few resources that we anyway have will go towards this nationalist discourse that is so linked so heavily linked to to neo neoliberalism There's a book I would recommend that tackles these aspects in Hungary. His essential argument is that neoliberalism is in, in essence an authoritarian project. A model to which the answers are very brutal before the right wing he came to power. I would 
to say a final word. I don't have too much time left. What's annoying is, at the end of the day, Mickey's book starts with the post-bellic period. What I liked was how the cultural sector worked before this, this time frame. What's interesting in Cluj is the fact that the Hungarian institutions somehow inherited the model from the strong Hungarian state upon which comes the model of the Romanian institutions. I think it's important to study the phenomena that was before the time from you studied in the book. that you're here and uh, thank you Mickey that uh, we can leave your book here in the 25 year anniversary of the transit house I had a fight with the book because in many of the processes that you described I was uh, implicated very closely can say a lot of things about the book. And I want to say some things that I noted down. Uh, one of the things that stayed with me was uh, your study that uh, we from the independent local scene we are in debt to you and also the cultural scenes huh? uh, one of the things that your book I think excels in is, is time Administration life is uh, somewhat close to the uh, cultural scene. One of the terms you propose, the interdependent, brings me with uh, the thought that the ecosystem that is uh, marginalized and uh, begins to disappear, it's indeed an ecosystem. We find ourselves in the, in the same spaces many times, uh, same people working on common projects. We were implicated at the uh, project of Fabrica de Pensula and So, as a time project, I see it as uh, being a transgenerational project. Me and my colleagues um, many of the colleagues.
Alexing uh, in the building uh, have been have been here for a long time and they are kind of old school. There is a whole series of people that keep coming back, collaborators as well. Those meetings between the generations and also projects that are thought of in time for me, they, they taught me a lot of, a lot of things. Another thing I wanted to mention related to your book is you accentuated it very clearly how we how we use the concepts and this shows us your inclination towards philosophy and Even the even the concepts uh, seem to be soft. They they are indeed they are heavy. They they are rough. And uh, you also show you also showed the political cultures assimilate those those concepts. this concept about uh, economic sustainability and every time you're talking with someone and he asks you why don't you start a business with uh, a bar or cafe and to sustain the, the institute life if, if you have success with uh, business and you you give money to, to let's say the te theater that this doesn't mean you you sustain the theater life I would like to say that not everybody in, in this section is interested in this kind of things uh, we're not talking about here the Broadway model where we we can see astonishing sums. But we also want to talk about the small businesses, the, the small uh, cultural institutions that uh, can't afford to, to pay those kind of funds. Also noticed that you also showed how other political models that There is a, another transition for the independent term and what the independent term means. You introduced the French models after the war and the American ones and uh, also the Yugoslav ones in a, in a very wonderful way. I noted something down here when you and Eugene were talking about spaces. And I remember that you make it at one point in the book. You were talking about cultural space that uh, was uh, a sort of a promise in 2016 that it would be realized here in Cluj. Uh, one 
question I, I have uh, about uh, this concept regarding the politics, social politics. This was a sort of panacea that for the cultural operators that lose their spaces. I really believe it's a solution for only a part of the cultural operators, but uh, I don't believe at all it's uh, a solution for uh, the rest, the rest of the projects. Let's say the projects that uh, regard the life in the in the city. Uh, and second, the transit house, which is. Uh, project that stands on its own. If it ends, it ends here. We are not going to do it uh, anywhere else. It's a project that uh, looks at this place as it is, and that's it. concept point of view we are changing things and we are changing material things and I appreciate that, that you were sensible to, to those models and conceptual apparatus uh, yeah one, one question you are talking about the creative sector and you're differentiating it between the uh, cultural one. It's related to a neoliberal ideology that's very rough. It also gives birth to needs. And maybe another question for a different study would be what kind of needs are produced in, in, in such frameworks. And I have some ideas. <laughs> I'll give myself the answer, but... Sometimes we see the language that becomes more and more specialized, uh, especially in the administration of the National Cultural Fund. It's probably that's why there aren't many, many projects there, because there aren't so many funds. But it's starting to become a zone that uh, it's more and more specialized. The, the artist uh, gets cut out of the process. The, the process has, it has, has no end. One of the process of the administration of the National Cultural Fund shows us that you cannot uh, you cannot hold multiple multiple events you cannot uh, intertwine the calendars of the events and we can see that uh, everything that gets pushed pushed in front is this need for the new My impression is that from a point on... Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish soon. If, let's say, the implementation time has halved, uh, what kind of project can you do in, in three months? Let's say if you want to do two projects or multiple projects. Some projects uh, take years.
my, my last race in 2019 when we had the transient house Some of the guys had had a project here regarding the, the workers and uh, a fabric. There, there was a story with uh, with some guys that were working on the project, and someone from from Untold came and said that there was nothing happening until Untold. Okay, thanks. Thank you for all the intervention, and now we are opening the debate. Nikki came with some suggestion about the debate, but of course, if you have other propositions, we, we won't decline them. I would like to, to ask you to limit yourself to, to the short intervention, to two or three minutes. Some of the themes that came out of this is the future, what can we do and how will we do it? Miki already told us that uh, we need uh, interdependence forms. <laughs> An interdependence that is, is similar in mushrooms. We have a more, let's say, pessimistic proposal. Uh, if in the past we had the hybridization with uh, neoliberals, now uh, we see the, the danger of the hybridizations with uh, different forms. And another theme is the state. What should the state do? What uh, should the state promise? We had different themes. Uh, one of uh, some of them were talking about uh, having faith in this. Some of them didn't want to have to do anything with the state. Hi everyone, I would like to first of all congratulate Miki. I'm really happy that I was one of your students and uh, I was able to share your ideas which are now in written form. I'm really happy to be here and listen to them. My idea, which is also a question, that is, has been on my mind from the very beginning since we spoke about Broadway and mushrooms. So my idea is that of the American model, and that is because I get the impression that Romanian artists criticize the American artistic model a lot. I'm talking about the United States of America, uh, and the USA industrializes <coughs> art, and yet I cannot help but ask myself, if there were solutions, are there any solutions, or are there any answers that we could use, that we could take from the USA? We can see that the Broadway and the off-Broadway models work really well in the US. So my question is, are there some, some good ideas, valuable ideas, that we could use in the way art and artists work here? I would like to say something very brief, uh, which relates to something that Cornel said. I think we should work on the foundation, because in the USA, uh, to speak about foundations, because they are supported by foundations in, in the USA. Yes, uh, the US model is interesting, it works. Of course, if you don't take a very close look at the victims, 
but we have to bring uh, everything into historical context. The great foundations in the US uh, stem from the manufacturing uh, American uh, a model, which was constituted at capitalism, which was constituted uh, at the beginning of last century. If we look at the digital digital field, we will realize that companies such as Amazon or Pansir or others do not show great interest. They do not seem to be. They are not really interested in uh, the bourgeois prestige of uh, New York, for instance. The money mainly goes into digital arc that can be commodified at some point, turned into merchandise or towards uh, the cinema. But there is no digital equivalent in uh, Guggenheim, for instance, or within uh, large bank foundations such as uh, Morgan and whatnot. Capitalism at the beginning of the 20th, 21st century is not very interested in, um, in um, giving independence to cultural entrepreneurs. And this is the model that uh, depicts uh, Cluj as well. We cannot uh, travel back in time and uh, replicate the past of the US model here in Cluj today. This would mean time traveling. This bubble we're talking about in the US is supported by uh, tax deductions, by prestige, uh, not so much in San Francisco and Silicon Valley as much as in Chicago and the East Coast. And that's where we are right now in Cluj. There are corporations and boards of trustees, for instance, that um, that support this uh, this cultural world. But I believe that our way uh, we should try to explain why we don't need uh, capital. Yes, but this is a question I cannot answer. I don't know if anyone would like to to add something to, to attempt an answer. Or if not, maybe there are other questions in the room. Thank you very much for this uh, first question, Ilinka. I would like to congratulate Miki on her research work and <coughs> as well as on her work as an active citizen for so many years. She continues her, her active citizen work, she's been doing so within institutions. It was very nice to listen to you, you had uh, such different and diverse approaches. So my question relates to the future. I think it's okay to think about culture as a public service. I think that we might have a consensus and everyone might agree with this. Even people coming from, um, from other walks of life or other ideologies. Everyone should have access to culture, right? We could agree with that. If you go to any type of community, people will tend to agree with this concept, just like people generally tend to agree with the fact that education should be free and accessible and a free public service. Just like with any other argument that becomes political at some point when you want to draw resources in order to be able to implement uh, public policy or a type of institution, the, the question arises is how do you do it? And I think you should stick to one important topic, one important theme. The question is what is that theme? It's like when you're trying to promote a lot of different things. 
but then realize that it's a very difficult to, uh, to solve all of the themes, all of the problems. So we need to stick to one, which is why culture and cultural services have to be public. And in order for that to happen, uh, we need resources, we need capital, just like Cornel Ban was saying. I don't agree with him. Where, so I think the question we should ask, we shouldn't ask why people who don't uh, give money, wh why they don't need culture. In Romania, this doesn't make too much sense. So perhaps we should we should ask why Facebook and Google do not finance uh, culture. It doesn't mean that Romania doesn't have capital that could be um, seeped into into culture, but I think uh, that's a dead end road, and that brings us to public funds public money. Maybe the city hall is a bit too rigid and maybe some people who want to work in these institutions cannot, uh, cannot be game changers. They cannot transform institutions so that these institutions become uh, guarantors of culture. But there might be other institutions that are still public but have a certain kind of autonomy. And these institutions might have some resources. So let me ask you this. What if the paintbrush factory uh, could continue by moving to uh, a university building, let's say? Right? The university is public and autonomous. So I'm thinking about I'm thinking about this possibility. Maybe there are certain institutions that are public but would be open but would be open to become facilitators for culture as a public good. So the question is how independent can the sector stay? And what does it want more to be autonomous, completely autonomous or independent, to be characterized by its autonomy, in other words, or And I would like to go back to what Cornelio was saying. I think that the nationalist paradigm uh, we were talking about is part of the future. But at the same time, if uh, we think of the administration of the National Cultural Fund, we see that around 2010, the um, money was stopped at some point. Indeed, there is very little money from uh, this uh, cultural fund. But my question to you, Miki, basically is the following. Should this cultural sector be rather more independent or more public? What's the main characteristic? What should be the main characteristic of this field, of this sector? And then we can use some more progressive institutions that could be guarantors for culture. Of course, we could add several ide other ideas to this, like uh, urban development, education, and so on. One of the hybridization options was to uh, talk to state institutions that are open enough and want a partnership. You cannot force them into anything. And speaking of universities, I think that we could have uh, a good partnership with the university as long as the university can also bear constructive uh, critic and, uh, critique. And now I remember that we met at Occupy UBB. I think that the university could come up with some solutions. 
course, uh, it cannot find, it cannot, it cannot come with a ma magic bullet, but for instance, it could allot 25% of its uh, rooms to the alumni. I think it's important to maintain this bond uh, with the graduates. If the space of universities were thought that way, were envisaged that way, we could have this continuous kind of culture uh, within universities and that's how we could also support young graduates. You cannot demand universities to um, allot all their rooms, but you could ask for 25% perhaps. I forgot to say something, uh, and that was this bit about universities, especially here in Cluj. We cannot avoid this topic, whichever way we look at culture. That is because uh, culture is uh, is part and parcel of the city and the university as well, because it has so many buildings, almost 300 buildings in Cluj. The university has almost 300 buildings. <laughs> and this is why I think that's inevitable that we raise the questions that Claudio was asking as well. But the topic of today's debate asks for the impossible. We need financing, but we don't want to be controlled, we want to be free, we want to use spaces, we want enough money. So these are topics that are contradictory. <laughs> this is the paradigm that Cornell was talking about, right? Uh, you, we might be financed, but we might not use, uh, not be able to use certain words, for instance. These are not just hypotheses. These are real struggles many people here in the room have gone through over the past few years. So this is why I think that maybe we might come across the same kind of conflict with universities. So in order to avoid such uh, difficult situations, I think we could expect the university to to give spaces uh, that have a greater degree of freedom. And the university here in Cluj is very diverse. We might be able to invite them to open some of their spaces so that we can also access them. Just like the City Hall here in Cluj has really tried hard with uh, Marasht Cinema. I don't know if you know the story of this uh, movie theatre, but it was gradually financed and then it was, uh, this space was, uh, was opened to the public, but then it was restricted. Given the real estate situation here, we can expect the great players too to produce and give us spaces. There are the producers, such as uh, Bosch, for instance. Uh, but um, but what I'm trying to say is that we can expect the university to try to help us, uh, support us with some uh, some kind of spaces. We can also take a look at theatres, operas, cinemas and all other spaces that belong to public state institutions. I believe uh, we have a short list of heads of institutions whom we can approach. We can go and ask these people the following question. Will you accept a different kind of uh, schedule, different kind of cultural program in your own uh, institution's program? This is the kind of constructive conflict I was talking about. I 
think politeness would be overrated in our current situation. I don't think that anyone here believes we're facing a rosy situation. Everyone knows that, that, that we're struggling. If there is any cultural producer who's thriving right now, please stand up right now. I want to applaud you. I want to give you a round of applause because everyone else is doing poorly. <laughs> I have to make a great effort not to uh, kill everyone's joy. I will start with a personal story. Of the 22 years since I've moved, while my friends moved to New Zealand, I can say that for eight years I published. Um, I was. I published a, a magazine. A magazine that was published four times a year. I issued this uh, this magazine with my students. At, at some point, uh, there was a discussion about the production costs that could be borne by. Uh, by the institution, the school I was teaching at. The discussions lasted for about a week and we reached the conclusion that it wouldn't be good to uh, have those covers co uh, co costs covered by, uh, by the institution. So I think that this idea about uh, collaborating with the universities might be an illusion. Don't think me passive, but back when I was a student, it's true there was censorship at the time, there were a lot of battles, political battles at the time. But back then, all the important universities in Romania had magazines that were financed by them and written by students, produced by students. Every faculty had a club. The teachers, the professors would chip in every now and then, but by and large, it was the students who um, who produce these magazines. or institutions, uh, so where are the clubs where um, students can get together and create together? I hope you don't think of me as passive, that's not my idea. What I'm thinking right now is, for instance, so I teach at the Faculty of Theatre, just like Mr. Claudio Turcuj, well he teaches at the he teaches film at the same faculty. Any civilized um, university or faculty in Europe has 
a theater, the theater of the university where students can go and act and have projects freely. So I'm really sorry for being a killjoy. We don't have financiers uh, to think in perspective, but we don't have uh, <coughs> academics to think about the future and about the fact that students have other rights, ha have other rights than just to go and uh, have a beer together with colleagues. Experience teaches me that if there's some kind of wonder we could reach the connection to the universities you were talking about, I think things will not get off the ground. Because I believe that many people working uh, within the university will try to censor ideas, will try to tell people that they cannot talk about certain topics. I think that people who, who, who help, like universities who might be able to help with spaces, will want to control the ideas that are propagated afterwards. When Claudia was speaking, I thought of the following thing. I see so many cases around me of people reinventing themselves and repositioning themselves. And I was wondering why did we start doing community work? The purpose to be active citizens makes me think of makes me think of a kind of awakening I remember when I was working at La Terenuri in Manashtori in the neighborhood in Cluj we were so fearful that we would lose our space so we would ask ourselves what do we do afterwards well now that we no longer have that space, we have to reinvent ourselves. Now I realize that Miki and I are no longer um, active in, the, in those projects, so we have to reinvent ourselves. And I believe that we have taken on different hats now, but we maintained our work ethic. And I find it fascinating to observe and to be part of this, of this repositioning, because I think the purpose is by and large the same. What we can see is that the public space is getting bigger, it's getting larger, it's not just the street where we protested or fought for statements so that the authorities and citizens be heard. But now I notice that public goods and public spaces can be debated and uh, renegotiated. And I think this is the next level and it might even be more subversive than we might imagine. I think that each and every one of us plants different kinds of seeds. We might not know what we will get, but we might get something interesting. We might have hybrid plants, who knows?
just very briefly, I would like to comment upon what you said, Claudio. When I was a student, I remember that I didn't have uh, university spaces for the exams, for uh, my projects. But at the same time, I remember that we had a special room, was it Yorga room, I think, uh, which was uh, part of the main building of the university. And I remember that we had that Occupy event. We reclaimed the space for every citizen, not just for students. So what you're saying is really nice and interesting, and I think we should march on this idea. At the same time, we should uh, bear in mind the fact that culture is a phenomenon that has always been there. It doesn't belong to the state. So I think that the state should take care of this cultural phenomenon. It should take care of it, not like it takes care of the forest, but like something precious, like uh, the army, right? Of course, we should, we should have spaces that are independent. On the other hand, when I go back to uh, the paintbrush factory, if I think of Z's space, if I think of this space we're in, well, I think these are spaces that can be used by students. Maybe we can uh, simply have a collaborative kind of system that's more integrative. <laughs> um, Miki is working at a university right now. Um, now, my approach is external, I have to say. about the former rectors uh, and the current and the former rector of uh, the Babish Boy University uh, and I think they also played a role in uh, how the university positions itself I would like to add some things as well I'm thinking of uh, a reactor uh, the independent theater in Cluj where I'm uh, the co-manager together with Juana Mardare it has been uh, supported by many cultural institutions in Cluj. Um, every summer, for instance, we were given spaces for our residents, for our projects. We were given money from uh, the faculty and from other institutions in Cluj. So, indeed, more often than not, when we ask for something, we get it. But I think it's uh, the way we relate to all of this is problematic. I don't think that the institutions must support the independent sector. I think they have to support themselves and the independent sector has to be uh, to, to support itself as well. So my question is, Well, of course, we make proposals and we ask for things, but why can't things happen the other way around? Why can't institutions come and make proposals and make requests? To what extent could the university use a transparent budget? Right? The university has five euros and say at the beginning of the year, we'll use these five euros to finance independent cultural projects. And the condition, our only condition would be for the project to include students. The National Theatre could do the same thing. 
It could allot a small part of the budget to projects. I'm lucky enough to know many people, but there might be younger cultural operators who don't know enough people um, and don't know where to go and ask for money. So I think this is an opportunity for a meet-up on uh, common ground so that everyone can win and everyone can in fact benefit. Because, of course, there is censorship as well. But I think that if we can see uh, the two-way benefits, things will look up in very broad lines, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Good evening. I would like to say a few things. About the discussion concerning universities, I don't think we should uh, leave it aside altogether. If we, even if we can raise some kind of uh, conflict, uh, there was, uh, I, I remember, um, the Equinox magazine belonging to the Faculty of Letters. I remember that they had a very critical issue in 2005, I believe, or slightly earlier. The reaction of the then uh, rector was that some of the writers who were uh, producing the magazine to be sacked. But there was a, a, a common um, reaction at the time, and uh, those persons were not sacked. I remember Occupy UBB back in 2013. I remember that the police came and wanted to evacuate us. We could see the reactions in real time, online, on the internet, and we were not evacuated. So, what I'm trying to say is that there is room for reclaiming critical positions, but we should base everything on reality. And Eugen Panescu knows this. We were talking about this topic in 2020. We were talking about identifying certain spaces um, that belong to the uh, to Babishwe University in Cluj, because this is a university that has. Uh, the smallest number of spaces, if we relate this number of spaces to its needs, in fact. I think we can take critical positions and whenever repercussions might arise, I think that we still have this uh, civic reaction in Cluj that can help, uh, protect us from abuse. Now, going back to public services and what was discussed in the first part of the debate, the problem in Cluj is not that we don't have culture as a public good. Speaking of untold, we were criticizing renting flats for a lot of money, and renting uh, the space for the festival for a lot of money without any kind of competition whatsoever. Well, there were reactions. Uh, saying, well, finally, Cluj is important and renowned. So people believe that uh, the festival already provides this kind of public service. I remember that back in 2006 or seven, the, Inter the International uh, Transylvania Fest Film Festival received uh, enough money, uh, little money, <laughs> received little money, and uh, I uh, began a campaign at the newspaper I was writing for at the time. So I drew a parallel between sports and culture and theater. I drew a parallel between the national and international uh, situations and after a week, the budget from the, the budget of the Cultural Council doubled the budget for a culture. And that was all due to this public pressure. But after Untold happened, I can no longer see this pressure 
because people believe that Untold, as a festival, offers this, provides this uh, public service. Basically, the space where the festival takes place is held uh, in, a, in a public area. So they feel like uh, like they are of public benefit to everyone, which is why they don't no longer feel that they have to do something for the public. I would like to say uh, in the end that I can't wait to read Miki Branishta's book and I can't wait to read her conclusions because we've had so many discussions throughout time about culture in Cluj. And I would also like to say that uh, I remembered this. The fact that we gather and talk about all these things here is a privilege. We had those years of freedom where we were able to meet in pubs at the paintbrush factory, in Insomnia Cafe, and in other unconventional spaces, including Apoca, where there was a community that other cities lacked. And at the same time, I feel this anger that we're losing this, that the energy doesn't live on. I see some familiar faces here in the room, but there are so many new faces. It's true that I, I haven't been part of the cultural scene over the past few years, but I feel like we no longer have that energy, that momentum. <coughs> so I am quite angry at the prospect of losing that momentum. Thank you and congratulations, Miki. But that energy wasn't an illusion. It's, it's still within us. Good evening. I come from Bucharest and my perspective is slightly different. But since I have uh, a thought and idea, I would like to share it with you. I was a local councillor at the City Hall in Bucharest. I still am, in fact. But I was part of the Culture Commission in my last term, so I know the figures really well. And not just the budget and the figures. I'm also well acquainted with all uh, the employment and the rents you were talking about, all the spaces that are available. Uh, I would just like to add something basic and fundamental and uh, concrete to our discussion. So in Bucharest, for instance, the city hall has been given to 100 and 350,000 lay yearly to all the cultural institutions that belong to the City Hall. And that's been happening since 2016. This is the money that is given uh, to culture by the City Hall. The cultural products, because you might wonder what kind of culture is produced in Bucharest. So there is no connection to the independent um, area and the independent sector. Nothing went to the independent sector between 2016 and 2020. Now the money, in fact, between two and four million lei is invested in uh, independent culture out of the 250-300 million they spent yearly. So I was wondering, economically speaking, and since uh, Cluj is, uh, is an entrepreneurial city, I think this is uh, this is something that also happened in Bucharest. The situations are quite similar, as far as I can see. So the taxes to the city hall will keep increasing, which means that the money comes back to the city hall, which means that the budget of the city hall of Cluj Napoca will increase and has already increased a lot. And understand from Alexandra here next to me that there is just one cultural center that gets uh, very little money from the city hall. And 
there is 10 million lei for um, grants. Perhaps this is an opportunity for Cluj. Perhaps the citizens of Cluj and the people in the cultural sector could ask for more money for culture in Cluj. I would like to remind you that in Bucharest we have so many other uh, smaller institutions uh, pertaining to the city hall and none of these spaces are open to the independent sector. So what I would like to say is that there is no such thing in Cluj, but maybe you could build a different model from the very get-go. You could allot more money to the independent <laughs> sector and do so constantly, maybe on a, on a yearly basis, on a yearly budget. And you could do it through institutions or otherwise. What I want to say is don't give up, don't give up on asking for money for budgets from city halls because the amounts are huge. And this would be a question to you. Um, we as local decision makers, we have never understood how we could evaluate or assess the, the quality of uh, cultural projects because I could in my whole career, I was uh, never able to see good, authentic um, cultural products within the city hall. In my opinion, the quality of uh, the projects I, uh, I saw is very low. I could attempt an answer. Asking money for structural asking money for wages, for instance, and for uh, costs, for maintenance costs, is uh, something we that's been haunting us for a long time because we kept hearing this argument: there is no legal framework for this kind of um, sponsorship. <laughs> Miki talks about an interview with Georgiou, who was the Minister of Culture. <coughs> and we were wondering during the pandemic, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about the rents? And the Minister of Culture kept saying, no, I cannot help you, this is state aid. But in a very short while, Companies, so uh, companies were helped in order to be able to pay their uh, rented spaces in shopping malls. Perhaps the Minister of Culture didn't have the right leverage at the time to negotiate uh, such costs for us. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to uh, the assessment of of quality, I think that. Uh, there needs to be some risk taking. You should spend a lot of money on bad productions in order to eventually gain and obtain good productions. spaces in the independent sector.
I think the most important point is that we should exploit first and foremost the, the infrastructure that we already have. We should we should Good night. If tomorrow the cultural centers we already have would disappear, I think the reaction will be just as small as it was when the paintbrush factory disappeared. I think people will cry for a day and that will be it. I think we should look a bit around and to reevaluate how important the independent sector is in the cultural scene inclusion. And here I will bring into discussion an opinion of a very important businessman inclusion, very famous one in regards to the development of the independent sector inclusion. He said, you should go and ask the people what they want. And if they give you an answer, you should produce precisely what they want. I would say this is a rather cynical answer because people seem to not understand what is the added value that the independent sector provides. And as long as the people do not understand these matters, the independent sector will remain, will remain rather a myth. And I do think his opinion, this this person's opinion, is uh, speaks to the way more people think than maybe we would like to. And it's a sad reality, but I do think it's it's rather a, a thinking pattern. People do ask more about the context of, of this claim, but I do think it's, it's not relevant who this person is. And here again, it's not important because it outlines a thinking pattern. It, it reflects a way of, of how the people of Cluj and the audiences position themselves to the independent sector. We often get to the conclusion that we're in a bubble and once we get out of that bubble we realize we realize we are restricted to our own reality and that things often are different outside our bubble. For me, it was a wake-up call to understand how people coming from the entrepreneurial sector approach art in general. If we do think about it, there are not not grants from this this side, from the entrepreneurial side. There's no prize from Google, for example. I think we should do. We shouldn't think in in a mechanical way about about these dynamics. And I think the dialogue exists between 
the cultural actors and the audiences, there is a constant exchange between them. Why then do the audiences not always feel uh, something common from, from the independent sector? I think it's a relative question. We thank you for coming tonight. These were one final word upstairs. There's an exhibition. Thank you.